Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good whatever, wherever you are. Welcome back to the Agacito Zinga Show, episode number 138, I'm going to say. I think it's 138. This is your host, Agostino. Welcome back. How you doing? How you feeling? How's it going? We're back, baby boy. New year, right? New year. Is it new you? As some people are doing that whole thing, as I ranted about the other day about new year's eve resolutions whatever it may be hoping i'm um, wishing actually you guys a happy new year we're having a year we actually want free it i'm actually right for once i'm wishing you guys a, a happy happy new year hope you guys have got started very well um most people should be back to work already if not yesterday then should be back today which this is when the podcast comes out on thursday i'm recording this very early in the morning um, as i came back from a run um and as you can hear from my voice nothing has changed um apart from me for this year nothing has really changed that much apart from maybe the fact that i got a haircut before the new year's eve festivity so i've got a little bit of a fresh fade here on the side and it's probably um maybe one of the best haircuts i've got so far um now no, i'm not saying it's as good as the haircut i got in f for fade or whatever it may be but as as i'm sitting here right now for the last i don't know let's say six haircuts i've got definitely the best one um and it was in the most um it was in it was in a barbershop that has it probably has the worst memories for me when i growing up in canon town there's a kind of a uh, a little branch of barbershops called mr t and whenever i was younger and i used to kind of have to go there because my regular place was full or because i needed a last minute haircut then i always ran into trouble the guys there were just the worst kind of barbers you'd ever meet um if the if the kind of stereotypical caribbean J- jamaican barbershops are very happy i know are very kind of um, laid back right and take their goddamn time cutting your hair they might go and eat some hot wings they might go eat some chinese food they might answer their phone a million times they might pop out and speak to a girl outside the barbershop or a guy or whoever it may be if that's the stereotype of a caribbean barbershop then the stereotype of an african barbershop is that they'll just run a mock through your hair in as less time as they can and get you out of the seats they can get the next guy in so they're all about the money all about the money and usually when you're all about the money what happens the quality suffers right the quality of your product the quality of your image sometimes takes a dip, bit of a dip you can even see it with the recent um fight that fuller made whoever took part in in rising the other day in japan against that tension dude right um it was billed as this big event right um that was taking place floyd May was gonna go fight this young um kind of like you know up and coming rising champion who's a champion in kickboxing and kind of compete there you know as a kind of way to kind of extension of what happened when he fought conor mcgregor but then it transpired that it wasn't going to be the sort of fight that we were thinking it was going to be it was going to be straight a boxing fight then floyd Mayweather flies out to japan that's a promo and then he comes back and says that he was duped and it was all this whole 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 circus that happened so by the time the fight did come around you expected it to be uh more than you expected it to be a little bit more than what it was actually transpired to be but then when we saw the fight and it took place, what we saw is one kid who was severely, 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 severely at disadvantage fighting one of the greatest boxers of living time. And he got dispatched within under a minute. But then what happened afterwards is that some people didn't look at Floyd Mayweather a, a different way. They're like thinking, hold on. You actually went there just for a cash grab and you fought this dude who had no business uh, fighting you in a ring, right? I probably could have put up a better fight than that dude, right? And that's not saying much. And then he went there for a nine million pound and got out of it. Now we all know forever is money motivated. We all know money is what rules his um kind of decision making, right? When you're when you're when you call yourself Floyd, money may Mayweather, you know, there's no real illusions as to what your current motives are. But sometimes when you always go for the money, when that's always the one thing that's on the front of your mind, you can there is a kind of possibility of damaging your legacy or damaging your reputation, right? In some way, shape, or form. Because, you know, money, you know, where is your moral compass when only money is your deciding factor? Where where are you gonna d- draw the line, right? I mean, I think I mentioned, I think I remember hearing actually someone on Joe Budden podcast say something like, "Oh, you wouldn't be surprised if the Floyd Mayweather ended up fighting a kangaroo." Do you know what I mean that's how money motivated he is? And I, you know, as 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 ridiculous as that statement is, it has a it has an inch of truth in it. You know, when you're that kind of guy and you're always motivated by money, unfortunately, some things are gonna go by the wayside. So for me you know 
New Year's has kind of been a bit of an interesting time to reflect on things and kind of get things started again or maybe kind of double down on some things maybe do away with some habits but for the most part i kind of know what i'm going to do um i haven't really written anything down concrete um that i'm going to go do at the end of the week so i'm going to try and get some things ironed out in my head but so far the kind of like immediate goals i'm trying to look after they're all kind of athletic based for the most part um i kind of want to do a 5k in under 24 minutes I want to also do a half marathon in under one hour and 30 minutes. So those are kind of my base benchmarks of the race I want to do this this year. And then when it comes to weight and all that body stuff, it would it would be advantageous if I want to run those kind of um, speeds or those times. Then I need to kind of shut off a lot of the pounds. So if I can get back to my fighting weight that I was a couple of years ago when I was, I think my lowest was like 180 pounds at the moment i'm like 220 so that would require me to lose about 40 pounds um which is not that um easy not that hard to do to be honest i can i lose weight pretty quickly if i stick to a strict diet um and that is something i'm gonna obviously do in the beginning of january and kind of get that sorted out and then when february comes around which is quite a short month i'll probably have the occasion i'll probably have the opportunity to go to uh, barcelona and do the half marathon i did there last time i kind of want to repeat the circuit i did a couple of years ago um and kind of get myself back into that kind of swing of things if i don't end up going to barcelona for the half marathon day i'll just find any half marathon that i can go to and then i'll kind of do that for the time being but apart from that um i kind of have an, an other kind of stretch goal and this is just in part because i've been listening to the new bad bunny album which is so 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 good which i'll probably talk about a bit later but um i kind of want I, I do not kind of i want to learn spanish this year i want to get that just locked and loaded this year you know with the brunette being spanish and me going back to spain a few times this year potentially maybe for primavera maybe for um sonar maybe for something maybe for the half marathon it's going to be ample opportunity for me to kind of practice ample opportunity to me to kind of um also flex my language skills when i'm in that environment and in general anyway it's like you know one of the most popular language one of the most popular languages in the world um I've always been kind of drawn to learning those kind of languages, especially because I I, I don't have my Portuguese base, which I probably should start with, but I'll start with Spanish for the most part. Go off to Portuguese because it's something that I should learn because, you know, coming from the country I come from and eventually kind of spoon up for there. But languages have always been a really big part of my life, something that I've always kind of, de- I've always kind of wanted to do for a long, long time. I've always kind of seen myself as a little bit of a... Um, polymath in that res- in that respect and you know in order to kind of declare myself that i need to have a few more strings to my bow and that does- and that doesn't include like djing and writing do you know what i mean i want actual um other skills that allow me to kind of move around the world with ease and learning a language would be amazing and also i just think it would just be a great little case study to kind of feature or in a video and a blog post and kind of put out there and say look i'm a dude i'm not flipping i'm not f- i'm not seven years old because people always say oh you can learn languages much easier when you're younger cool but you can still do it when you're older right it's like losing weight losing weight is also easier when you're younger but you can still do it when you're older so like you just give up so when people throw those kind of statements i don't know why they're doing it i don't know if it's what's the purpose of saying that statement it's just throw people off so they don't do it anymore i'm not too sure but um i know i, I know what i kind of know what i want to do in that respect how i want to get it started and um yeah it's going to be an interesting it's going to be an interesting experience regardless it's going to be something it's not going to be easy to do i know that for sure uh learning a language just does take a lot of practice does take a lot of dedication and time and probably is going to involve me putting away a lot of time even more so than my reading the reading thing has got has become quite easy to kind of do for the most part i have to admit especially if i just especially if i just like if I've constructed my life around reading, like if I'm going to work, if I'm at lunch break and I take my book with me and I travel back home, I can always kind of squeeze in the time. But to sit down and study to learn language is something that you really need to really craft some time out in order to do. So hopefully I can do that very, very, very soon. Um, apart from that, nothing else is going on for me on that regard. So I'm kind of keeping my head down, like I said, for January and just concentrating on working and doing all that nice malarkey. And then... No big trips to plan for the for the month for the month really nothing for the six month first six months apart from maybe festivals and stuff and yeah just essentially just working just doing what I was doing in in last year and just kind of trying to level up this stuff a bit with the podcast so I level up the stuff I'm doing the DJing hopefully kind of get a bit of a bump in my pay maybe get a bit of bump in the 
in the gigs that I'm doing around the around London and maybe around the country, and then kind of go from there. And and also, who knows as well? Maybe try and get my driving license. Something as well that I need to get done as well, especially with the DJing stuff. Like having a driving license and being able to travel around and drive around the gigs would be super super handy because there's loads of places around the UK that would be very welcoming of having my services and establishments, and that would be super cool. But just in general too, especially when you go on holiday. And you want to travel to different islands or you, or you go to a place where it doesn't necessarily have the best transport system, which most places don't, right? Especially the places that you want to go to that are quite, quite idyllic. They don't have the most, you know, bustling um, trans, uh, transport or well, public transport system in the first place. So the only place to get around is by, you know, renting a car or whatever it may be. And it's fairly easy in other countries that aren't the UK. So, you know, it's something to take advantage of for the most part. So let's see if... That's something also add on a list. But like I said, I'm going to write a list at the end of the week. Get that sorted out and prepped and drafted and kind of figure out what I want to do. Nice, actionable. Nothing super long. I'm not going to, because in the past, I used to do really long list that never really went anywhere, which is what I mentioned the other, in the other podcast. That, you know, it's got to be tied to an action. It's got to be tied. It's got to be something definitive. It's got to be something really he's honed in and zeroed in on. It can't be something like vague, like get healthy. It's got to be something really, really specific. And then from there, you can kind of work backwards and some steps around it. And before in the past, I was, I was like everyone else, you know, I would make a list, write up, you know, 10 to, you know, 10 to 20 stuff that I want to do, which sounds amazing. Don't get me wrong. But then, you know, by the end of it, you don't end up scratching up maybe five. But sometimes if you do 10 or if you do five on your list, then what happens during the year is that um, the one thing that you do, you do and you finish, it then ends up kind of sprouting off into two other things that you kind of want to pick up later on. And same, same with the second thing, blah, blah, blah. So by the time you look back in the year, you think, oh, wow, I did a lot more than I realized. Why? Because you only had five goals, but the five goals then led on to another five things that you went to, or maybe another 10 things. So, you know, maybe start small and then let it kind of sprout out from there. But enough about me and my New Year's Eve plans, because, you know, those things are boring and everyone's kind of flooding the flipping timeline with those nonsenses. Let's get straight in to the topics. And number one, maybe is a good way to kind of start the the year and to kind of get everyone back on a even kill and kind of get people sometimes you know heady heights can be good right it's good to have your head in the clouds it's good to be dreamy and to think oh my god i want to do this i want to do that i want to be here i want to be there but sometimes it's good just to kind of simmer down simmer the heck down and just say to yourself okay regardless of where i want to be every opportunity that i get i'm going to make sure i put my best foot forward and deliver my best piece of work or i bring my best self forward Right, so that even if they do reject me, even if they don't like what, what what I'm doing, at least I can sleep well at night knowing that I worked extremely, I worked as hard as any other time I ever, uh, any other time I have worked in order to get this right. And this one example shows that sometimes maybe you know, well sometimes maybe or more often than not, it doesn't happen. Or what happens is that you get to a position where you're you know you finally reach the skies and you start doing that really um, what you call it destructive thing self-destructive thing which is called resting on your laurels right when you start to kind of you know maybe believe your shit don't stink you start to think maybe you don't need to do as much because you're there now not really man usually when you're there is when you need to work even harder because everyone else below you is kind of chomping at a bit to get where you're at so you need to kind of you know it's probably the hardest thing they say a lot in football isn't it they say uh, the team leading the team first place in the premier league has the most hardest place of everyone in the league because they're having to keep up the they're having to keep a consistent pace and ward everyone off because you can't give you can't give the team second or third a sniff or any sort of hint that you're faulting you're fault you're, you're faltering or you know you're maybe you know you maybe hit a roadblock you can't give them any 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 cause to expect that maybe you might make a mistake you just got to consistently keep that that the kind of tempo going and the hope is that consistently keeping that unrealistic quote-unquote tempo they'll suddenly go you know what fuck this enough is enough i'm not i'm just gonna give up and let and let he or she take over and um yeah so this video i'm talking about now is tiffany had this po- the other day i think she was in miami or whatever she had like a new year's eve show and she had a bit of a stinker and everyone's kind of up in arms about it or some people are up in arms about it some people you know probably don't give a flying sod but I, i'm interested to see the reaction of people online oops tmz like, uh, video so super loud i'll lower that a bit um it's interesting to see the, the response of people online because you know you hear a lot of uh i think sometimes even though it's a bad mistake she made yes i know she shouldn't have done it and you know maybe you should be more prepared it does go to show how well she likes she is in the industry that everyone is kind of coming out of out 
to her defense regarding this, right? But what is effectively happened is that I think she was performing in a night. Was it a nightclub? What does the description say here? Tiffany Haddish had a difficult New Year's Eve during a show in Miami, especially when the crowd started to disperse mid show. So she had a, she had, she had a New Year's Eve um, comedy show in Miami. I'm assuming, um, you know, one of those big things that you do towards the end of the year, your agent's books for you and you get paid a gazillion amounts of money to stand on stage, tell some jokes and someone comes and plays music afterwards. So a pretty kind of basic run of the mill performance. But, there's been a lot of talk within the comedic circles industry that she isn't that funny anyway, right? So some people are already kind of looking forward to seeing her fall flat on her face. But I still think it's a good, you know, a good little lesson learned for everyone else out there in terms of, you know, understanding what it takes to actually maintain your position once you finally get quote unquote on. So I'll play it now and then you can listen to it via audio or you can watch the video here along. When you when you start to when you start to mention your mum, right, in order to kind of get some sort of sympathy, or when you start talking about the party that's going to happen afterwards, or when you're the, when you're meant to be part of the attraction and you're trying to sell another event, you know you fucked up, you know you know you flopped. So I'm pretty sure she's aware she's flopped. But what I do think it's a reminder of is again, I always do this for myself. I try to kind of keep that kind of same sort of work ethic and consistency. I am a firm believer that how you do one thing is how you do everything, right? And I think maybe in some respects or, you know, just, you know, also respecting your audience, all that sort of stuff comes into it. But I think you have to treat the audience with respect whenever, wherever you are, whatever station that you're doing, especially in Tiffany Haddish's case, maybe it's a bit more disappointing because, you know, she's finally got what she wanted in her career. And Tiffany Haddish, for me, I've always been a big fan uh, before I even knew who she was. Um, oddly enough, when I went to LA uh, a couple of years ago to go to the first golf wang. No, sorry, the second golf winning ever, I think, yeah, a couple of years ago, right? I went to LA um, on my own, uh, met some randoms out there in a, an amazing hostel I stayed in. I think it was a Hollywood, uh, what was it? Hollywood Boulevard or one of those things? USA, Hollywood, one of those. Anyway, it was a hostel. It was a really good hostel. Fucking awesome hostel, really good vibes, and which is not really um, a given, right? Not all hostels are like that, because some hostels I've been to, especially, well, not no, actually, maybe only in Europe, actually, for the most part. But some hostels you go to, they don't really have the best of, of vibe, right? Because the whole idea about a hostel is to kind of unite people who are maybe, you know, vagabonding um, alone at the same sort of time. And you can kind of, you know, cross paths and maybe swap notes and maybe decide that you met someone that you really like as the best who's going to turn into like a travel best bud. And you're going to go off and kind of adventure with yourselves in another place, right? So it's a kind of good place to kind of meet people, to kind of maybe down tools, recom um, um, recom re recompress or decompress, reevaluate where you want to go, blah, 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 blah. So this hostel I went to was amazing. It was a great time. I ended up meeting a, a, a great bunch of like New Zealand and Australian dudes who, you know, I don't think it's, I think it's impossible to meet a uh, dick that's from Australia or, or New Zealand, right? Like, I don't think they have them. They don't exist, man. They're all the most safest guys ever in the world. Um, especially if you don't mind that sort of like laughy, jockey mentality guy, right? Some people, some guys I know don't like that kind of personality. They don't like that, you know, that kind of dude. But I love that dude, man. That dude is my friend um because I, i'm probably that guy anyway deep down but i try and suppress it and try you know act a bit more sophisticated quote unquote but they were amazing they were a great laugh and we ended up going out 
So we ended up buying a ticket to go to a comedy, sh um, a comedy show in uh, LA. And we went to the Laugh Factory, actually, in LA, which was awesome. And we ended up seeing Chris D'Elia because one of the guys, no, actually one of the girls in the group, she was a big fan of Chris D'Elia, so she ended up going to see Chris D'Elia. And then luckily on that night, we also ended up seeing uh, Tony Rock and Tiffany Haddish. Tiffany Haddish was hosting that night, and Tony Rock also appeared, I think, before Chris D'Elia or when he closed out sort of thing. And it was a great experience, and I got to see Tiffany Haddish for the first time. Um, I've seen a Cosby show before, so I kind of knew how it worked, but usually, you know, the host isn't usually someone you kind of keep an eye on or you kind of remember. But we, we all remember who Tiffany Haddish was. Now, one, she looked amazing, right? So it was quite cool to see, like, this really attractive black woman on stage, like, introducing the comedians and whatever it may be. So that that helped. But number two, she has such a commanding presence in the room. She just captivated everyone's attention. She held your attention. She was riffing with people off to, um, from the stage. Most of it, like, she had a few maybe set-up jokes, but for the most part, she was just, like, taking a piss out of everyone on the stage and just being a, a good time, introducing people, getting their names wrong on purpose, like, just being cool. And I remember that I was thinking, okay, like, you know when you know people say, ah, oh, you know the program X Factor, right? That's a good example, right? It, it probably, you know, it's probably lost a bit of its magic over the years, but the whole point of X Factor is that X Factor, right? It's like when you see it, you just know. You just know that person's going to be a star. It's just, it's not, it's not even something within dispute. You just know if you put them in the right situation, to give them the right direction with the right people, they're going to, they're going to be off, off to the races. And you can see with Tiffany Haddish, okay, this girl's going to be a star. Now, I didn't think she was going to be a star and with the way she transpired. I didn't think it was going to be this quick or it's going to be to this magnitude. But I was not surprised at all when I saw it happen. And also, I was a bit warmed and, and loved the goodwill from other comedians. Because if you know anything about comedians, if you've, watched, if you've listened to any comedian sort of podcast or anything along the lines, you'll know that that whole fraternity of comedians, they're not the most forgiving, right? When someone's a dick, like they're a dick and everyone in the industry knows a small town, especially in LA or in the US for the most part, where most of the kind of big comedians are word gets around and that kind of person gets iced out for the most part so if somebody's not if somebody's getting unwarranted praise like for sure you you're, you're for sure going to hear it so when i saw all of the comedians in the industry kind of you know backing her and giving her her props and sharing their stories about how they how they saw her come up and how she slept on their couch how they helped her out with this gig or how she helped them out with this thing it was so hot for me to see and i thought you know what finally right one of the good guys or one of the good girls for instance has kind of got the role because sometimes you know you can get the you can get a bit um beaten down when you find out a person that you really looked up to is a bit of a dick and they get all the opportunities that, that 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 they have that they want but they don't necessarily have the best attitude it can sometimes you know make you feel a bit bummed out but when some of the good people get it you're like yes finally so it I, I'm 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 quite I'm quite warm as well to hear that you know off the back of this TMZ off the back of this uh, Miami gig that a lot of comedians are coming out and also, you know, supporting her and giving her support and saying, look, everyone bombs, don't worry about it. But the problem that she has here is that she's not bombing on like a regular, you know, a regular gig that she did somewhere, right? In a comedy show, in a comedy store or sorry, in a comedy club somewhere around the country. She's bombing in a show during a show that was planned for probably a long time, something that she had prior, probably a prior notice about and something that the attendees paid a lot of money to attend, I'm assuming, right? Uh, and a New Year's Eve show in Miami to see Tiffany Haddish is on paper is an amazing show, especially with a musical, whatever musical guest they happen to get on there. So I'm assuming the tickets weren't cheap. So with that in mind, you kind of want to make sure you give the people a good show, especially when you're, because, you know, if it was just her hosting and introducing acts before they came up and stuff, fair enough, but it seemed like they gave her a good chunk of time, like maybe half an hour to do her stand up and then kind of riff into the first act. And it didn't really go as planned. And as good as the support has been for the other comedians in the industry, I think something is kind of getting lost in translation of like, you know, when you get given a big gig like that, you should be prepared. You should go in there, but you shouldn't know what you're talking about. Um, for the you know taking it back to our regular folk kind of situation when you have an interview all right or when you know you or i don't know interview is probably a good example or uh, let's say interview when you have an interview you won't necessarily go in there unprepared right and i'm not meaning unprepared like you don't know exactly what you applied for but i'm prepared where you don't even know the the person who found it you don't know some key little details about what they recently sold you haven't gone on their social media and checked some things that you might want to change just to have that in your locker you have to kind of have your bases covered now i don't believe in over preparing i don't believe in studying to the 10th degree for a fucking test and shit but i do believe in covering your bases somewhat right having a you know a kind of uh, a broad maybe sparse knowledge of various areas at the same time and then hoping that on the day you can kind of riff off of them in, in that respect but then i would also say that maybe for a new year's eve show in miami maybe you should just have your set locked and loaded you should just have it boom 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 listed off by heart you just know it 
how to do it because it's a big show. I'm presuming there's gonna be quite some. There's gonna be quite a lot of time constraints around that show. It being New Year's Eve, it being in Miami, right? Showbiz. You, you you're gonna to want to come in there and really give a good show, especially to end off the uh, amazing year for you. So it was a bit disappointing to see that. You know, it it seems like um, Tiffany has just got a bit fucked up before the gig. Had a few drinks. There's, there's some videos of her actually sipping or swigging on a massive bottle of Ciroc, which I don't blame her because Ciroc is fucking lovely. But she's swigging on a massive bottle of Ciroc on stage whilst performing, which is never a good, never a good thing. During, even during my time of sobriety last year, during sober October, yes, I hated it because I was DJing at the time. So DJing in a nightclub is probably maybe, maybe similar to being on stage as a comedian during a comedy club. Maybe it is, but maybe not because you know I spend a lot, a lot longer than a comedian. They're only probably there on set maybe for maximum an hour and something, right? So even though I must, I might have hated going into a nightclub and not having a drink. I also did respect or did kind of come to realization that actually to do a be- to do a good job at anything, you have to be you have to be sober for the most part. You can't be inebriated. And I'm not saying you have to be like stone cold sober. You can maybe have a shot if you want to level your nerves. I know some people like to have a cigarette for the nicotine high, a bit of weed, whatever it may be, like a one toke. Fair enough. But you can't be absolutely like, you know monged out your mind that doesn't work that way and i think tiff is kind of you know probably excited drinking before the, um the set probably the set started going wrong then immediately well, you know when something goes starts going wrong you want to not remember or you want to not feel you start drinking alcohol and then guess what happens we have a situation that we have here so it's disappointing it's sad but again like, i think it's sobering to see for the new year that even the biggest stars out there can sometimes fail to prepare and when they're prepared to prepare they're prepared to fail hey buzzwords um so take that as a lesson into your everyday life whatever situation you have prepare man just take the time out to prepare um the longer that you prepare or the more in advance you prepare the more comfortable you'll be in that situation you won't be as nervous because you know you've done the work right you know you've done the work and again like i said before put your best foot forward and whatever response you get from the crowd is whatever what it is but what they're saying about bombing bombing is where you go to like an actual nightclub and you have, you're trying out a new set or you're trying out a set that you've already done and you just fuck it up. You just have an off day. You know, I don't know, you mess up your lines, whatever it may be. That's bombing. No problem. It's everyone has an off day. Or the crowd just doesn't like you, whatever it may be, right? But this isn't bombing. This is just she forgot her notes. She forgot them off by her head, off top from her head. She forgot them in, in the physical copy, whatever it may be. And it's just like ended up into a shit show. So much so that people left and got up out of the stage, out of the auditorium, whatever it may be. The getting up off, out of the auditorium is a bit weird, in my opinion, again. I've never... You know, people go to cinema and they're like, oh, the movie was rubbish, I was left halfway through. It's like, but you paid already. You've already wasted half your time. Why don't you just stay? Where are you going to go now? You're going to go back out, get a refund and go to another movie again? You're wasting so much time. I never got that whole I'm leaving thing. It's such. It's, it's a little bit virtue signaling, right? Look at me. I'm disgusted. I don't like this public sign of kind of, you know, or disapproval it doesn't necessarily need to happen because for the most part everyone in the room knows she's doing a bad job you don't need the extra layer of your fucking pettiness to go and stand up and say you know what i've had enough like come on just relax and sit down for the most part i don't know or just wait until the music starts not that big of a deal really to be honest but hey you know everyone kind of has their own um way of doing things and maybe they want to vote with their you know feet and also want to maybe voice some displeasure later when they're going to probably speak to managers and shit but yeah there's a reminder with Tiffany Haddish that you have to be on your P's and Q's. You have to prepare for all things and all eventualities because you never just, you never know, man. And like I said, you can never rest on your laurels. You can't rest on your laurels. You can't just think because now you're where you are, where you are. You can just suddenly stop practicing or stop taking any sort of effort in what you're doing. You have to always, always put your best foot forward because, you know, this industry or just life in general, there's always somebody ready to take your place. And that's the last thing anyone wants, is it? Isn't it? <sighs> What is next else on our list here? Uh, Ebro, new job. Okay. Even though these are things I don't actually care about, it's good to talk about them because like I said before, sometimes these little topics are a good um, explanation for other things going on around the world. So, news kind of broke the other day um, that Ebro Darden from Hot 97 of uh, Ebro in the Morning fame has now um, has uh, got a new job. He's joined Apple as a global editorial head of hip hop and R and B. So a lot of people on the internet I saw because again I like to read I like seeing these co- these articles and the first thing that I do is read the comments. I think the comments are always a good indication of what the current climate is, what people are saying because sometimes you know you can sometimes get an impression of people 
you know, you can find, you can maybe form your own impression or you can maybe have an impression that you see in other outlets and stuff. But then sometimes the real opinion is basically based on the comments and what kind of feedback they get. And sometimes some artists are a bit deluded and, you know, they say they don't read stuff or they say that most of the comments they get is good. But the ones that don't, they know they don't get the good ones. And sometimes it's a good way to kind of like gauge how you maybe should act accordingly in public. And for the most part, you know, Ebro divides opinion with some of the hip hop kids out there because, you know, they sometimes think he's kind of, he purposely and cornerly and maybe cornerly as a corny guy, he maybe purposely plays on a whole like being an old head. And, you know, he's kind of, I think his name on Instagram is called Old Man Something, right? So he kind of probably plays on that, plays a bad guy in hip hop now. And um, in general, kids are surprised that he got the job because in most of his interviews, especially with some of the younger generation kids, he always kind of does that thing that a lot of the guys, even some of the guys at Breakfast Club, they do that thing where like they purposely let the artists know again and again that they haven't listened to their music, right? That they're only there because of the label kind of got them the, the kind of seat at the table per se, which I always find very, very disrespectful in that regard. I don't really see what that's all about. Um, again, maybe this is the generational gap kind of maybe can explain it, but I never got the thing about interviewing somebody and having no idea what they're doing, what they did before. I know I, it, has, it used to irk me a lot when I used to sometimes listen to BBC Radio 5 Live or whatever it may be, or BBC Radio 2, and they used to have authors on and read particular books, and they'd have them on, and then the, the, the interviewer or the radio host had clearly not even read read a couple of interviews with the person or maybe watched a video interview, because sometimes if you don't have to read, maybe reading a book before the interview is maybe a bit of a stretch, right? But at least watch the author in the interview. You can maybe get a brief synopsis of what they're kind of talking about of the book through the interview. But they'd done no background research and just kind of going off the notes that a producer gave them, which are usually, you know, very simplistic and kind of surface and don't have any sort of depth to them and aren't really conducive to answering, to asking better questions. So it always kind of run me the wrong way. I never really got what that was about. But then I also didn't get why all the kids were so desperate to get on Hot 97 when most of these, these SoundCloud rappers or some of these guys from the younger generation have, ine have inevitably, invariably, got on by kind of circumventing this hip-hop i mean the sorry the radio platforms that's what they've kind of done right with the advent of streaming you don't necessarily need to be a radio anymore if you want to be a radio maybe it's because you want to be a commercial star you know kind of cross over to pop in some regards but for the most part still where the main re revenue and streams or the main kind of exposure comes through is through streaming platforms so i never really got why I never really got why Ebro didn't do the research about artists he was um, interviewing, and I also didn't get why these Sankar rappers were so different to get onto a show where someone clearly didn't give a fuck who you who you were and what you're about, and also wasn't going to get you to the next level they actually thought they were going to get you to. So that was kind of surprising. But this is this to me isn't surprising. Ebro getting his job. So this is an article from just to put out there my stance. I'm not surprised at all. So this is an article from Billboard. And, uh, it says here. Hot 97, New York Morning Personality, um, Apple Music um, beats one anchor host Ebro has appoint, has been appointed Apple Music Global Editorial Head of Hip Hop and R&B. In this, in this newly designed, designated role, which he starts today on January 2nd, Darden will manage a team of Hip Hop and R&B editors in developing editorial strategies for artists, albums and song races in the US and globally. Huh. Are they, are they turning Apple Music into a fucking label? Based in... Um, hmm. Based in New York, Darden will continue to host the popular Hot 97 shows. So he's not leaving that. He will also continue to showcase latest music and shows and and issues on his on his show on there. Uh, prior to Darden's appointment, Carly Cherry served as Apple's head of artist curation with a specific focus on hip hop and R and B. In announcing Darden's expanded role at hip hop music, Apple Music, the service global the services global director of editorial Rachel Newman told Billboard. We're excited that Ebro is joining us in a full-time capacity, having dedicated his life and career to hip-hop and R&B and pop music. He has to offer, he has much to offer. One of Ebro's most defining characters is that he has a great ear for where R&B hip-hop are transcending and evolving beyond even the balls of the US. Hmm, does he really though? Does he travel much? Don't think so. Um, does he, I don't, I don't know, is that really true though? I'm not too sure. Again, me no no. He was obviously taking the leadership position for us that's not just in hip hop and R&B, but also in the communities where the music is made, which is made, which is also exciting and, and something unique to Ebro. Outlining his immediate goals, Darden said, the first things first um, is making sure that we're firing on all cylinders in the best way possible, helping consumers find the way that they love music that they love, also helping us connect with the consumers in the real time, in a real way, sorry. Once I learn about 
once I learn about what's needed to achieve that, it will be looking ahead and figuring out ways to serve the communities and where hip hop and R&B music is made. Black music comes from the community. This is some, this is music made by people living real lives, not just speaking on behalf of those real lives. If we're doing our job, Darden continues, we'll be, con we'll be able to get down to the community level and connect with those. This is a global position as well. So to, as well as, as, so as we build this out, I'll be doing the same I'll think I want to do in America, UK, France, India, Japan, Brazil, and other countries. I'll be wherever R&B hip hop are being consumed and working to create communication amongst communities around the world through Apple Music, making sure that black music is getting recognized and developing the next superstar. Darden is joined. Oh, okay. There we go. So, interesting, right? Interesting, interesting. So, Darden served as Hotline 7 uh, music director. Yeah, we all know this before. So, interesting. Global head of it's it's interesting because he doesn't necessarily strike me. He was never struck stri strike me as somebody who was um at the forefront for discovering new artists or bringing them to the forefront, right? Because this seems like a way of this seems like a role where he's going to be in charge of maybe cult. Maybe no discovering is the right way. He's never even he's never really seemed very editorial to me either in that respect. If I'm being completely honest. Um, how to kind of get that message across right in terms of how to communicate stuff with the artist um if i'm looking at hot 97 in the main part i don't know if it's anything to do with him but they were very late on getting on top of the whole um youtube uh video clip stuff right that's why the breakfast club kind of stole a march on hot 97 for the most part uh they obviously had maybe more interesting guests maybe more um explosive interviews but for the most part they kind of stole a march on hot 97 by really going hard with the whole digital landscape thing Hot 97 caught up really late. And then when they did it, you know, they were kind of seemed a bit fuddy-duddy because they kind of took this stance um, where it was mostly based on, you know, politics. Ibro talking about a lot of politics during the whole... I think the, prior to the whole um, Black Lives Matter movement kind of rising, that kind of was a time some of the people on the station kind of took a stance and took a position of being maybe quote-unquote on-air on activist, which maybe kind of tainted a little bit of their messaging in some regard, you know, because, you know, maybe sometimes people want to go, people want to listen to the show just to kind of have an escape from day-to-day -day lives, not want to be reminded what's happening in um, society, but then maybe on their regard, on their part, they see it as their obligation to do that, who knows? But regardless, it never really seemed as if like they had a real good grasp on how they're communicating the message or how they come across. It always seemed as if like they were uh, they were aware of it but didn't care. You know, Ebro kind of played on the whole idea of him being an you know a basically an adult troll, which kind of worked in his in his graces in that respect. Um, but again, it's not. I'm not surprised he got the job. Like I said in the beginning, I just think sometimes people need to realize that most people in these big positions, especially people that are given the jobs that like Ebro is given. Um, the ones above them don't necessarily know, um, aren't necessarily as plugged into their culture as they should be. That's why they hire a person like Ibra, right? In order to kind of make those kind of decisions. And then when they want to make the next step forward, then the only possible person that they're gonna hire are the ones in and amongst them. Because if they, if they didn't know who, if they didn't know who to hire before Ibra came in, do you think if they get him on board and he's saying all the right things and he's got this really good background, twenty seven, blah 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 blah? That they're going to go out and kind of get an external person and you might know a bit more who might be a little bit more plugged into leader it doesn't make any sense and this isn't even like a good this isn't i don't think this is even like a big front-facing role where they're kind of wanting somebody who's kind of well known uh to kind of front something this kind of just seemed like an editorial thing where you kind of need somebody to be a little bit more plugged in and understand the digital landscape and how to get exposure and how to really connect with the artists and how to get them connected with their fans it's not like a influencer type role so that kind of makes it confusing too because if that was the case then maybe he's a good example of it because you know he is kind of you know one of the recognizable faces in in um, new york and maybe u.s based hip-hop radio but again like i said i just don't think it's a big surprise i think if you're a kid out then you're pissed off you've got this job i think it's your responsibility to get on your shit and to make sure that you're involved in these conversations but i don't think it's his responsibility to kind of like you know what's that word called to kind of uh, move out of the way and give the young kids room that's that's ridiculous i don't know if all, i never really got that kind of way of thinking oh give the kids space so they can come in and do it as well like why why should i do that i'm earning i'm it's, it, it, this is my career i'm earning a living do you know what i mean I'm, I'm trying to support my family with this why should i be worried about what the kids are doing or how they feel about something that doesn't make any sort of sense whatsoever so that's something that never really kind of vibed with me that well um so if you do want to get him out of the role you have to then decide what you want to do and kind of make the right choices the right move to kind of get involved in these circles but again i'm not surprised um i think the thing i'm surprised about is that it, it does sound like apple music are starting to kind of veer into label territory 
it sounds like that's what they're heading into because why else would Apple want to do what they're doing? Maybe because in general, you know, Spotify has an editorial board. Uh, I'm assuming um, editorial team, sorry. I'm assuming Tidal probably have one too and YouTube Music. So it makes sense that they were doing this, but it seems that they're really trying to angle themselves maybe along the, you know, the kind of um, the label route because especially some of the rec- may- the big record labels and most of the main ones are located, head, head offices are in New York as well in the first place. So that might may lend more credence to it. So you just see how it develops. You just see where it goes from there. Like I said, there might be more people more deserving of it. Who really gives a fuck? I think, like I said, people like Ebro, they don't stay. They don't have jobs for for no reason, right? They have jobs because they're obviously good at what they do. And in general, for the most part, they just outlast. I think some of these people are just able to continually get really sick positions on paper. Don't get me wrong, because again, it's just another job um, that he signed on for. Um, they're able to do that because they just they just endure they just are able to hang around or not hang around they're able to kind of endure and fight through kind of difficult periods and then when it comes to the next sort of phase or next sort of era comes about and needs the most for a role they're not person to come and hire so that's another thing that needs to kind of be, be uh said more often you know what one of the main traits is not hard work or one of the kind of you know paths to success is not mainly just even hard work sometimes it can just be you know endurance being able to kind of withstand all the kind of pellets you're going to get along the way and then maybe along the way at the end of the road there'll be a chance for you to finally then kind of get your just deserves because there'll be no one else left around because everyone's kind of gave up because it's not as comfortable as it was before the start so yeah so i guess congrats to, to ebro on the, on the role interesting to see how it develops and where it goes from there and what apple do next time and or maybe the next couple of years or so where their quote-unquote label or whatever situation it is now at the moment because it seems it seems like a bit like the head in that kind of realm but maybe i'm completely wrong who knows um what's next on this list bad bunny album yeah so this album right i haven't probably mentioned it beforehand but this album is fucking fire it's absolute fire flames. I don't, I'm not sure why it's not being talked about more often. I'm not sure why people are not really mentioning it. Maybe because it's a Spanish album and no one really fucking understands what he's saying for the most part. Because if you don't speak Spanish, you're kind of probably going to be a bit of a, you know, um, what's that word called? Disadvantage as I am. But I'm kind of going through the lyrics and translating some of them and seeing the, seeing the messages and getting a vibe through it. But let's just step back a bit and just um, remember that I listened to this album before I knew what it was called or anything, right? This album came out of the blue. I think it released just, just before Christmas, just before the new year. So no one actually knew it was coming out. I don't think he had told anyone he was doing work. I think it was going to be working out, but no one knew it was dropping this year and he decided to kind of uh, drop it this year, right? Um, now, uh, I think it stands for Siempre, right? Uh, 10X10, 10X100 Pre. I'm pretty sure it stands for Siempre, Siempre. So... Bad Bunny's got a new album out. It just got um, rated at eight point two on Pitchfork. Again, like I said, I don't necessarily care about reviews on these kind of re- websites for the most part because you know they have their own biases included in it. But you know, whatever. If if that's something that you care about, then you'd know that it's been eight eight point two on Pitchfork. But I just think outside of it not being English speaking, it being a Spanish language album, one thing that really struck struck home with me and something I'm hoping we probably see in a new year with albums coming out because you know. There's been a lot of talk about maybe too, too many albums coming out, blah, 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 whatever it may be. I don't necessarily agree with that. What I think has been the issue has been there's been a lack, a distinct lack of quality in the albums. I think we've got some good songs. I think if you went to make a playlist of 100 of the best songs this year, I think you could probably make a solid one that you wouldn't want to skip through any tracks. I'm pretty sure you could probably muster that together. No doubt. No, no shadow of a doubt you could do that. But I think if you ask somebody to put together a list of 10 of the best albums front to back you'd really struggle this year like that was sonically tight cohesive projects you really really struggle and um this bad bunny album proved it because number one i don't understand the language so that's a big barrier and kind of the kind of emotive feel that you have with music number one but then number two one of the things that really struck me was a sequencing it felt like an album too often last year with the releases that came out they just felt like singles that were kind of like cut and pasted together right that's why it felt it didn't feel like an album like when i remember when um when i when the rumors came out that uh drake and future were putting out an album together what was it um the one with the diamonds on the front i forgot what that what that one's called right uh oh, where's the album Let's see if i can find it here ba 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 drake future album what was that album called what time to be alive yeah there we go when i um do you remember when that rumors came out that, that they were putting together an album and they were working on it, right? I, I was super excited when I heard when I heard that news the first time. 
But then as more details came by and transpired, you kind of heard that they were working on, I think whilst Drake was on tour for Nothing Was The Same or something along those kind of lines, right? And I was like, oh, I kind of immediately sunk into my chair and thought, okay, this album ain't, ain't going to be that good. It's going to be a bit shit, right? And the only reason why I say that is because I'm a big believer, especially after, you know, listening to watch or watching a few musical documentaries or reading a few autobiographies, whatever it may be. I'm just don't believe in this idea of like turning around albums in two weeks and they're being masterpieces. I think there are there are the outliers that exist in life, especially there are outliers that exist too. you know, like the people we know we had those people in school all the time who never studied but could turn to a test and just kind of always get a B, right? And if they studied once, they'd kind of get an A star. But for the most part, for all of us normies out there, we had to revise, right? So it's the same thing, it's the same kind of, that same thinking I kind of pass on to any anything artistic. I think there are some people out there who can turn around really tight albums in two weeks. But for the most part, we most of us have to kind of go into our bag, really isolate ourselves, uh, listen to loads of music, really dig on deep into our souls and kind of extract, you know, some really poignant topics that we want to talk about and put some beats together and make sure it's all cohesive, blah, blah, blah. We have to really work at it, most of us. So when I heard that Drake and Future made this on tour, immediately I knew it was to be substandard. And when the album did come out, it felt that way. It felt like just a collection of singles put together. It felt like maybe... Future might have had some ideas and some songs that he kind of felt were missing something and Drake came in and kind of filled the holes. But it wasn't a cohesive point. It wasn't like they were sitting down together and making an album, right? Or an EP, whatever it may be. But this Bad Bunny album, honestly, feels like he they, he actually sat down and made an album. This was something that he sat down and made an actual album. How is it going to sound? How's it, how's it all fit together? And again, like I said, the sequencing is fucking insane. Nothing is out of place on this album. Every track follows, every track that follows each other has some sort of element or tie in that ties it to the previous track. It's incredible, incredible, incredible album. And I don't think a lot more people are speaking about it because, again, maybe a Spanish, a Spanish, a Spanish um, language based pod, Spanish speaking um, album. For the most part, unless you understand the language, you might not emote with it. But I don't know, maybe like in the same vein that I like electronic music, for the most part, it doesn't have most mainly that many vocals on it, unless you listen to like in you know, the old school house or whatever, maybe some new disco. But for the most part, there's no real vocals f for any new music I listen to when I go out and party. And I always have a really st um, strong visceral connection to it, right? Sometimes the tracks you hear will make your hair stand on end, right? Um, it's like when I first heard uh, Mr. Fingers, right? The first the, the, the first time I heard that, I was like, whoa, right? The legendary Chicago house track. You're like, Jesus Christ, right? And it made my, even now thinking about it, it makes my hair stand on end. And that has, and that doesn't really have that many bars. So if it does, it's just like, you know, a kind of droney, hymny, sort of like sermon going on in the background. But for the most part, what really makes you emote to it is the, the beat. Dum, da, dum, da, dum, 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 da, dum, da, dum, da, dum. That really kind of gets it to you, right? Or, get, or digs in deep into your soul. And this Bad Bunny album is the same way. Like, I don't think there's one skippable track on it. I played it when it first came out and I've been banging it out in the gym ever since. So for those of you kind of wanting some new music, I'd recommend you check that out. And again, like I said, I'm hoping that this Bad Bunny album can kind of set a precedent going forward that we're going to maybe hear some albums being made this year that have got made, maybe put a bit more effort into it, right? They've been kind of constructed. That's why I kind of really liked Not Where, Not All Heroes Wear Capes by uh, Metro Boomin that came out. Number one, obviously, it's, it's had a bit of a uh, filmy, scory vibe to it. And then when he heard his interviews lately, he basically was saying that, Metro Boomin was saying that he's going to eventually kind of score. Uh, score against a, mu so, uh, a movie that, that he's kind of maybe self-producing that makes sense but what why that worked why Travis Scott's album worked why Tyler the Creator's album worked um, was that they sounded like an actual album like it sounded like whenever they recorded track number one they also had track number four in mind right even if they didn't know at the time it's because you, instead of making these questions of singles and putting them together which is what everyone's doing and I'm and I know it's probably to form the numbers I know it's probably to kind of get around to the get around um, you know, get more money from the streaming platforms if you have a, a free disc album that is like two hours long in, a, in the sense of like someone like The Dream. But I would really appreciate if more people kind of sat down instead of trying to give us free disc albums, just sat down and tried to give us an album of maximum 12 tracks or maybe a couple bonuses that were actually cohesive and strong and sonically fit together. And then, and then maybe also another thing, when they go to select their, their tracks they want for the album, maybe sit down a, l a longer time than they do at the moment and really think about how they sequence it. 
not just throw anything together because you know they don't really have any time like just sequence it properly like properly probably for real and you definitely get a difference for it because i think if you move around one or two tracks on the bad bunny album it might not sound as good as it sounded to me previously but the way it's sequenced everything just kind of adds to it and again like i said it's just an easier way to kind of get around scoring you can kind of get around getting more fans and getting higher reviews with, with especially with these review sites if you just sequence it well because they're playing it you know they want to kind of money hear a theme something going on instead of just like skipping to one track and nothing sounds the same at all so i recommend you check it out bad bunny's album is out now on all streaming platforms it's called Te- um x100 pre or siempre siempre if you're a spanish-speaking person what else is here coachella 2019 oh this this lineup just came out the other day and everyone is excited or happy about the lineup which i am too actually for the most part for the most part um an amazing lineup the tickets are going to sell out in an absolute jiffy so if you don't have any money on june jan 4th then forget about it but yeah the lineup is fucking insane really really good man really really good um I'm I'm thinking about going Primavera Festival this this year. Um, the lineup for some people hasn't been as as what you call it as um, exciting as a previous lineup, but I think this lineup probably appeals to most people because you know it's got the good kind of range of most kind of artists that people are listening to at the moment. But for the most part, I thought this lineup is fucking insane. And as always, you know, Prim- Coachella has that weird reputation with people in the US and people in the, in the, in, the, in the Europe too. A couple of my friends from the UK who have been to Coachella have always said it's a little bit over, um, overrated, right? Because obviously we're a bit spoiled in that respect. I think the whole like European festival scene is amazing. It's like at probably the best place it's ever been in a long, long time. There was a time when people would go far, far flung places around the world to attend the festivals. But now most of the big European festivals have some of the most interesting acts, have some of the best programming. So there's no reason even to go to something like a Coachella. But Coachella is kind of very steadily kind of, you know, defined a lot of its kind of musical taste based on what's kind of going on and being a great amalgamation i think coachella maybe represents spotify music to me more than anything else it's a great amalgamation of everything that everyone kind of listens to without being segregated like there's everything like on one day there is a bit of hip-hop there's a bit of indie there's a bit of metal it's all kind of put together in a really nice way it's not really hot punch together where sometimes you know something like wireless festival for instance it kind of only caters to a particular sort of sound a particular kind of demographic um love box in the same sort of vein in that regard right um, even stuff like field day and stuff like they appeal to a certain type of people whereas coachella for the most part musically again not talking about the pictures not talking about people you see on the street stuffing as a just in terms of the music taste like i'm into all of those kind of things and i'm not gonna go to coachella with my top off wearing beads and shit do you know what i mean i'm just gonna go dress normally and i think that's the strength of this kind of festival but um so the, the lamp been released as always they do this interesting thing where they do a uh, two weekends in a row so if you miss the first weekend there's the next weekend they book them in which i think i'm not sure if they did that first i'm not, I'm not i didn't really hear of another festival doing the same sort of thing where they kind of have a lineup the same lineup booked for two weekends in a row which is quite cool actually there was no i, I remember a, a festival did that there was a there's a punk festival i forgot what it's called now i think they do it in philadelphia i forgot the name of it and they do a similar sort of thing where they have like a, a double a twi- a double weekend of kind of uh guests uh, and they mirror for both weekends so the lineup for friday the 12th so it's taking part it's taking place on the uh april so friday april the 12th and this weekend of saturday april the 13th and then the following weekend of the 19th and the 20th so on the friday you have here uh Jan- uh childish gambino headlining with uh janelle monet the 1975 we've got a great album that came out just last year dj snake who's obviously someone that's kind of made for a festival lineup suez diplo rufus the soul who i'm not familiar with black pink who are just kind of youtube now they're a massive korean girl band or girl pop band so they'll be quite interesting to see play because from what i've seen online they've only got one album out and like, and they've got like less than 10 it's got nine songs on it so imagine they've got one album out less than nine songs with less than 10 songs on it and they're co-headlining coachella on a friday it's like it's fucking nuts in it but you know um k-pop is second of the world they've got anderson pack and uh free nationals they've got casey musgrove's juice world which should be cool there on that platform again juice world i'm a big fan of his but i'm really hoping that he does performs it without backing track at coachella you can't go there and just be playing your mp3 and lowering down the highs in the mids you have to go there without a vocal backing track and actually sing because if you hear him if you heard him live he's actually quite he's actually got quite a good voice like you can actually hold a, a decent note so it'd be cool to see him perform and he's probably one of the best 
of the new school kids that we have out at the moment, right? He's got a good little range about him. You know, you got you can see you can see a future in him in terms of songwriting and all that sort of stuff, and him kind of crossing over to different genres and not sounding corny. So I'm hoping he does really pull it in and can make a performance. Because again, for us that are not going, we'll be able to stream this live from our own homes. Um, you also have here. Los Tuscanes, the the Tijuana, who I'm not sure, the Fisher, I'm not sure, Jaden Smith, Nina Kravitz is playing, which would be sick. Rosalia again, another one with a great album last year. Gorgon City, Mona Fred, um, who else I know? The Division, uh, Hot Sense Eighty Two is another great DJ. Charlotte Gainsbourg again made a, had an amazing album that came out the other day, and another album again out today. I think an EP. Uh, Sophie, which is another great album. I missed her performing where? Was it the O2 Academy or something along those lines? That was quite, that seemed really cool. Tierra Wack, who everyone's kind of been very impressed by the way she put her album last year, which was basically um, one minute um, tracks. I think 12 tracks, all one minute each. And she uploaded it all onto Instagram and then later onto Spotify, which is fucking cool. And all the tracks are fucking amazing. And each track has a minute little video to it too, which is another really cool she done. Uh, Polo and Pan, I'm not sure who are. Beach Fossils again, a legendary group. Um, Yellow Days. The Frights, not the Pure, but he used two more. A lot of people are really big on uh, Kira, Kira Kira Bonito, who I'm a big fan of. JPEG Mafia, again, another good artist that I like. Another good rapper that I like too. Uh, there, Riff Raff is playing. Yeah, Har no, sorry, Haraf and Riff. I thought Riff Raff playing Coachella. I thought that's nuts. Uh, what else is here? Ross from Friends. Then on the Saturday, another great, another great lineup on the Saturday. Fucking amazing, right? So headline on the Saturday is Tame Impala. Then co-headlining is Solange, Kid Cudi, Weezer, Apex Twin, J Balvin, Billy Eilish, Billy Eilish, uh, Bass Nectar. Fuck me. Forget the last two, but let's just see Solange, Kid Cudi, Weezer, Apex Twin, uh, J Balvin, and Billy. Um, and J Balvin basically are awesome. Billy, Billy Eilish again. I'm not too sold on for the most part again she's super young as well so there might be time for her to grow as nice but i'm not too kind of sold on her oh yeah I forgot to show you there's a sunday too what am i talking about so it's friday saturday and sunday um then you got forte um you got uh and the queens you got wiz khalifa which would be awesome in la you got mac mac demarco imagine the amount of weed smoke imagine the amount of uh what do, what do you call it um when you when when you get high people, other people smoking, I forgot the name of it. But yeah, it's gonna be fucking amazing. Matt Demarco again, as always, it's gonna be fucking cool. As at there, Sheck West gonna be performing there. Um, Virgil Abloh's DJing, I'm assuming at, at Coachella, which is a, probably another big gig. Did he play before? I think he did. Maybe with, with Fiopa Zander back in the day. Uh, Tale of Us, Mr. Easy, legendary electro um, person there. Ty Siegel, I'm a big fan of. Uh, FKJ, Ildris Elba's DJing, Sir's playing, it should be cool. I'm sure it's Jabba's DJing, right? He's not doing anything else. Maybe he is. I don't know, because he's a super talented guy. He does, does everything. But I know he DJ. He's got a pretty cool um set he did for Mix Mag or something along those lines. That was quite cool. Just check that out. He's sweating profusely in it, though, so I can feel his pain being a black dude that sweats a lot. He's sweating a lot. He's fucking wiping his brow every two seconds or whatever it may be. But check that out. He's got a really good set that he does recently too. So um, he just was a big. I think he's a DJ back in the day actually when he was younger. So he's like he can DJ like for real, for real. Um, he plays a lot of house and stuff. So check that out. Uh, you got Soul Se Soul Selection who will do a, an amazing online radio show. I think they do an Apple Music. They I still quite a lot of their tunes on there. They're fucking awesome. So check them out too. Soul Selection. They make fucking Soul 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 Selection. So Soul. And then E C T I O N, they're fucking awesome. Um, you got okay. Oh, Murder Beats is gonna be DJ. I'm assuming too. That would be quite cool to hear. Lee Burridge is gonna be playing there. Another kind of familiar. There's a lot of kind of housey DJs playing in it this time at uh, there. And then on the Sunday headlining, you got Ariana Grande, which was cool because that last album was very good. It made, made a fan of me. I wasn't necessarily a big fan of her, mostly because of the Pharrell Productions on there's about three or four tracks that Pharrell kind of co-produced, so that's quite cool. But she's had an interesting year overall, so that'll be quite cool to see her perform live. Um, Khalid, um, I'm not really that big of a fan of, but you know, he's got some good tracks here and there. Zid, uh, Gustaf, Gust Gustaf, Gustaf again, another electro from the kind of you know, um, that whole scene with uh, Busy P and all those guys. Uh, Bad Bunny, of course, co headlining, which is going to be fucking awesome, as you mentioned before. Dylan Francis, Churches, YG should be sick. Um, then you got Sirs, Playboy Carti. You got her. So, Sir and her are playing Blood Orange, Pusha T, Unknown Mortal Orchestra, Orchestra K. Trinanda, Gucci Gang. I don't know who that is. I'm assuming that's going to be um, Lil Pump and Gucci Mane, right? I'm assuming. Um, John Hopkins, Sophie Tucker, Burner Boy, 
Liza, Dermot, Kent, Burnaby is a really big set for him, man. It's going to be fucking awesome. There's a big Nigerian community out in, in, in LA too, so that'd be, that should be fucking sick to see how that performs. Um, Nightmare, Nightmare Perfume, uh, Boy Pablo, Guy Gerber, Hayuku, Emily King, Dennis Lloyd, Alice Merton, Salu, 07 Shake, Soccer Mummy, which would be sick, Rico Nasty, Color Boy. Man, this lineup is absolutely sick. Honestly, really, really good. Um, yes, yeah, so this takes place very, very soon. So that's that Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. I forgot, and it's actually a Sunday too. Amazing. Usually the third day, the lineup's always a bit dead, but they actually went all the way in with the lineup, all the way in, all the way fucking in. Charles Gambino, Tamin Parla, Ariana Grande is fucking insane. Insane, 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 insane. Really good lineup. So check it out. I think tickets come out when they say here? January second, January the 4th. Um, so that's tomorrow at 11 a.m. PT. So if you're on the on the hype list for that, definitely check those out because once those kind of pa- once those once those passes go, they all the other passes are going to triple in triple double in price. Especially with Travis Gambino performing because he hasn't really announced an album, he hasn't announced a tour, so it might be the only time you're going to catch him kind of performing live and you know with his kind of recent um, resurgence and kind of hype in kind of the general populace, it's going to be maybe a good time to see him there perform. And you never know, by the time the show comes around, we might get an announcement on what new album he's going to put out and all that sort of stuff. That usually happens too. And Taming Parla too, I think they made an actual Instagram post recently actually talking about Coachella and saying that, you know, they actually might actually be, be releasing new music before the date. So that should be fucking awesome. But imagine seeing um, Taming Parla in LA, man, tripping on acid. It might be so cool. So fucking cool. And, um, yeah, so that should be amazing. But I'm probably not going to go to this. I'm probably just going to watch this from the comfort of my own home. Um, like I said before, going to LA's core is amazing, but it does cost an arm and leg. It's really expensive to go. Something you have to kind of plan way, way, way in advance. Something that you have to kind of, you know, like I said before, if you don't have the money, for most people that have been spent a lot of money during Christmas buying gifts for their friends and stuff, you probably don't have the, the funds available now to kind of really drop 350 quid on a ticket. And then you have to equate the price of the flights, the Airbnb there, all that stuff is going to really, really rack up um, very, very quickly. Um, and then Primavera, which I want to go to, um, which I am going to go to, the Primavera, uh, sound festival. See a lamp that quickly check again, so I can ram myself for the lineup. Lineup. So that's on Thursday to Saturday. Pretty long festival. They did the other way around. Instead of the Sunday, they did it Thursday to Saturday, for the most part. And I'll check. What's this? Access to Why? Why is it? Why is it? Why is it doing this? Why is it doing this? Uh, okay, festival. Primavera Sound Barcelona. Bish Bash Bosh program. What's happening here? So post up. Let's get a post up here. We can read it. So um the line appears interesting. They don't have any co hide lines or anything. I don't think so for the most part. Maybe because they're trying to promote the whole inclusivity thing. I'm not sure, but no one's well, no one's name's really in bold or anything. Everyone's kind of listed as is on the lineup. So you got three dates, or for the most part, right? The thirtieth, the thirty-first of May, and then the first of June. I guess I'll put it on screen so you guys can see too. But if not, I'll read it out quickly. Um, who have you got here, lineup wise? But people weren't really happy with it actually when I when I read about it on on the internet. People were like, eh, they're gonna pass. But for me, I'm always the big again. I I just I just love festivals because. I was always, you know, I always kind of gave myself that false dream that I was going to attend more gigs in a certain calendar year, but it never happens, right? You never, I never kind of get around to it just because, you know, keeping up with gigs is hard. It's much harder than keeping up with um, events for the most part or club nights. When I want to go to, to go to a DJ, I'll just log into Resident Advisor or to Facebook and just find the events, right? But logging onto that stuff on social and trying to find gigs for certain artists is difficult because you have to be following them. You've got to know what they're, when they release. They're hardcore fans, but the tickets is very difficult to kind of get an understanding of when you guys in. There's not really the, there's not really an RA equivalent um, for acts, for instance, for like gig, for like gig events. I try and use song kick sometimes, but again, you have to continually check it. It's not something I always check because obviously RA has the editorial side of it where they put in our features and kind of things. So you're always checking anyway. Uh, but for the most part, I like to kind of circumvent all that by going to festivals and then kind of, you know, seeing all the people that I kind of wanted to see in that year or I was curious to kind of check out for like a fraction of the price, right? Because if you're paying, I think the maximum you're going to pay for a premium sound festival pass is like maybe 250 pounds if you're going to do VIP or something along those kind of lines. But for the most part, it's like 180 or whatever it may be. And 180, um, 
you know, for the most part, each person you're going to see in London is going to be about 30, 20 to 30 pounds. So you're going to see a lot more people for, you know, for much less money. So something I always kind of prefer to do. So the Primavera Sound Festival is in Barcelona on the 30th and 31st and 1st of June. Um, on the 30th, they've got 07 Shake, which is everywhere in it, in the festival scene, which is quite cool to see. Um, Ellis Phoebe Lou, Anastasia Kristen, Aprat, Bacar, Big Thief, Brat Star. Uh, Bridget St. John, Carcass, Charlie XXC, which I'm a big fan of, um, Christina the Queens, Clara, Courtney Barnett, Dan Funk, of course, Danny Brown, which would be cool because the album should be out by then, Dennis Salter, another great DJ, The Projections, Dream, Dream Wife, and the Star Emp- Empire of, which will, you know, Legendary Pro Sound, if you know them, Erica Badu, which would be cool, FK Twigs, Future, which would be sick, Gangster Boo, Guau, Guided by Voices, I Am, Interpol, Japanese, Jada G, blah, blah, blah. blah. And then next day, Agora, Anti Naples, Dr. Rubenstein, which I saw the other day DJing. So she was quite all Janelle Monet, Isabel, who else is on there? Object. A lot of DJs, isn't it? I'm actually saying it. A lot of DJs. Isa Albany. But yeah, still something I'd, I'd definitely want to go to. Check out not many bands or indie bands or people that we'd know playing at that time but Jarvis Cocker should be there as well playing that should be awesome Jay Balvin's playing James Blake by the time the album's coming out because it leaks that's a new album he's releasing is kind of in the works um what else you have there Nini Cherie who's had a big year too she's the mother of um what's her, what's her name and I forgot her fucking name the little young mixed race girl that does all the songs and the notes and stuff that's her mum in it I'm assuming yeah that's her right I'm pretty sure uh Richie Horton close um yeah so it's a good lineup i think for a, a european festival now a lot of them a lot more have to kind of be said like um gaston breeze back again this year best of all we've got a good lineup um there's that gotwood festival that's always good boomtown something that a lot of the alternative scene people go to with the trance scene so it's, it's gonna be probably a big year for festivals and what people are doing and especially with the killers doing a little comeback tour we might see a few more places in in the europe kind of pop up and say you know they've got some big acts lined up because people are probably finding the lineup with stuff so it might be it might be a time to maybe sit tight and kind of wait and see what the other lineups say but for the big ones you're going to need to kind of have the cash available now to kind of lay that down and kind of get that sorted and make sure you're kind of on the list to kind of get a pass if not you're out of the races and no one's gonna you know you're not gonna be able to get a ticket again anywhere else if for the most part so get on it right now uh, da, da, da. what else is happening here oh you seen this vegan sausage roll from Greg's, right? I saw it pop up on my Twitter feed. I was like, "This is fucking lols." Um, yeah, sausage. Greg's has decided to, you know, for the new year, uh, launch a vegan sausage roll, and everyone on social media is obviously up in arms. Kind of, not really, but I just love the art. I, I love the, I love the ad for it. I love the marketing campaign, and I think you know, I've worked on a lot of marketing jobs before in my time. And sometimes I think, you know, a lot of these people that work in these roles are sort of stealing a living. They don't really know what they're doing. It's just the same old rehash thing again and again and again. But on some occasions, you can get some interesting things, right? You can get some companies out there doing some cool stuff, right? They can really come sometimes to surprise you. And Greg's did in this respect because they've sort of made it like a, a play on... Uh, a smartphone like you know technology sort of reviews and kind of highlight in that respect but i'll just play the video so you can kind of see it overall i saw it on twitter which is quite cool i'll get up here make sure the volume is up on twitter and play there so it's like a video of the such as kind of twisting around showing its key features <laughs> so awesome, isn't it? Designed by Pegs in Newcastle. I think mean, that's awesome. So, so, sort of playing on like, you know, I'm designed by Apple in like Super Team California sort of thing. And if you, and I've got an actual, another little clip actually, which was quite interesting, which kind of shows, I'm not, again, I'm not sure if this is real, but I saw a packaging. I'm assuming someone from the press who did a press day went to the launching of the vegan social roll, kind of got this, but it sort of looks like the packaging that they're releasing for it, right? Uh, where is it? 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 I think this might be it. Hopefully this is it. Yeah, so here's the supposed packaging of the of this fucking uh, vegan sausage roll from Greg's, right? Again, playing on the whole smartphone vibe. So it sort of basically looks like an Apple box. 
So this lady on Twitter posted it called Courtney Pochin. So Courtney, one word, Pochin spelled P-O-C-H-I-N. You can check it out on there on her Twitter. On her Twitter. If not, you can just quickly check this video out towards the end here. So I'll show it. So basically, it's effectively like a little a Apple phone case. What they basically done here. That's awesome, right? Um, this is the definition of extra. Greg's official. Look at this. So if you zoom in there, it does say vegan edition, uh, case, the length of it, the flake resolution, optimal, taste level, maximum, megabytes 10. I'm not sure how they calculate the bytes, but that's quite cool, man. That's amazing, right? That's what marketing should be about. Look at that. That's just cleverly done. Really cleverly done. I love it. Just, again, just playing on the kind of, you know, Apple... Um, launches of, of their things and how they kind of go grandiose about the most mundane of things and again i just think it's a cool idea cool activation i'm not again i'm not too sure if you know the vegan community out there was chomping at a bit to you know to have um greg's kind of you know introduce a vegan social raw option but for the most part everyone seems to be receiving it very well I, I think on my end you know sometimes you know with the whole vegan uh community you know it can sort of be a bit annoying when you know for the most part you know, they're very opinionated on what people should be eating and stuff. But, you know, you're just having, you're just eating kind of crappy food alternatives that are vegan. But, you know, it's good to kind of offer options for different people who have different dietary needs, fair play. But again, my my main kind of like salute to this is just the marketing campaign. I think the marketing campaign for this is fucking awesome. They rolled it out amazing. Fucking amazing. Thunder replies as well have been awesome. Seeing kind of Greg's account go back to go back and forth and kind of like, you know, um, banter with some of the people that are criticizing the the, 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 the vegan social role but i think it's awesome it's gotten some great coverage on social and everyone's kind of been speaking about it and yeah overall so bravo to anyone that everyone that was involved in that kind of campaign i'm hoping it was all in-house i'm hoping i didn't have hire an agency to kind of do it for them um yeah salute man this is the kind of work we all want to do when we kind of work in these kind of dead-end jobs. We kind of do, we want to do something a little bit exciting, a little bit something a little bit out of the blue. And I'm sure someone from the company wasn't happy when they heard uh, the marketing team were going to run a whole marketing campaign regarding the, the vegan social role and not have one person on camera, right? It's kind of, except for the kind of hand that comes towards the end that's kind of chomping the social role in hand. There's no like, you know, naffy narrator voice like the vegan social role by Greg. No, they didn't do any of that kind of naff stuff. And I'm sure someone from corporate or someone from head office, someone from the very top kind of wanting to get involved and be like, you know, stick their dick in it and trying to, you know, fuck things up a bit. But they let the marketing team do what they need to do. And now we've got this great advertising campaign. So yeah, check it out. I'll probably end up um, reviewing it myself just for the just for the lowest plainly. But yeah, cool to see. I'd love to, love to hear what the sales figures are like for the vegan social role. Because obviously the exposure and engagement on social is, is amazing, but sometimes the real hard stone walled metrics are the ones that you kind of get in real life. Like how many more people came to shop and ordered a vegan social? How many more people are like, you know what, I need that thing right now. So that'd be flipping cool to check out in the end. But anyway, we're here, we're here now at one hour, right? That's a nice, a nice hour has dropped of the Action Zinga Show podcast. Thank you again for tuning in and hanging out with me. It's always a pleasure, never a chore. As always, for more information regarding moi and everything that I do, check out my site, exonzinga.com, for that information. I'm DJing again the whole of the month of January. I'm not going anywhere. For the most part, kind of staying my, staying myself sitting very clearly here in London town. Get myself nice and fit for the whole racing calendar that's kind of pop up, which is going to be an absolute, you know, it's going to, it's, it's going to hurt because, you know, I haven't been in this, I haven't been in this flow for a while. I'm aiming to do all the big races that I've kind of done before in the past whether they're the Richmond 10K, whether it's the half marathon, the Hackney half, whether it's the Chippenham half, whether it's another marathon at the end of the year. I'm doing every single one that I kind of did in the past and kind of really get myself back into a kind of real sense, a real flow. Because I think, you know, with the kind of mindset I have now and the work like I had beforehand, I think married it, it's going to the only good things are going to come of it. Because in the past, I kind of had the whole workout thing down. My mindset wasn't really where it should be. But I think, you know, as I am now, maybe, 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 hopefully, possibly, there'll be some better outcomes to come in the future. But again, thanks again for tuning in. Happy, happy new year, you crazy mo focus. And hopefully you have a great rest of it, actually. You know, I hope you got started and doing what you wanted to do and you haven't been waiting around for someone else to give you permission to do something you want to do. You've been doing it anyway. And I'll see you guys again very, very soon. Peace.